Shalom, Chavri Imam Stephen Benum. You're watching Israeli News Live. Have a special guest here with us today, Pastor Paul Bagley uh, from the United States. And Pastor Paul Bagley, also the host of the Coming Apocalypse television program. Uh, pleasure to have you, uh, Brother Bagley, here on Israeli News Live today to talk about the prophetic side of what's happening uh, over in Syria. God bless you, my brother. God bless. It's so good. So good to be with you again, Brother Stephen. So good. Thank you, my brother. As you may well know already, as you woke up, or you probably knew about this yesterday, uh, that President Donald Trump has, has launched uh, different different conflicting reports on how many. Russia says 59. Uh, I think U.S. says 50 cruise missiles uh, inside of Syria at the air base there in Homs, uh, taking out uh, President uh, Bashar al-Assad's war planes for the, as, as many are saying, the alleged chemical attacks uh, uh, by the Assad government on uh, civilian population inside of Syria. You, you're up to speed on that already, I assume. Totally up to speed. Went live last night on it and covered it all. And, and yes, and, and I even got both sides of the story, you know, the U.S. media side. They're now confirming with Russia it was 59 Tomahawk missiles. And uh, so I've got the American media side. I've got the Russian Assad side. So, yep, up to speed. Yes, we, we, you know, what was really weird, Pastor Paul, was when we were on April the 3rd, the day before the attack, uh, we had covered a story on troop movement by the U.S. And in my own broadcast, I had shared in there, I don't think President Trump was actually aware of what's going on. Now, I know that may be a little bit far-fetched because he is the President of the United States, uh, but we had tracked how that Obama, who originally gave the order to move the desert camo uh, tanks and military equipment to Germany, later, when people started asking, why are you sending desert camo, but a lot of people wondered if it was going to end up in Syria. And sure enough, it goes from Germany to Poland, Poland to Romania. And then on the 3rd, actually on the 2nd of April, this equipment was being loaded up onto uh, two, two huge ARC ships. One, both of those go to Beirut, Lebanon. The other one, Pastor Paul, goes down through the uh, Suez Canal and into and now is in Jordan on the southern, southern border in Aquaba right there. And we were seeing that it looks like that the uh, United States is preparing to go inside and bring down Bashar al-Assad from, from, uh, from his position as president. Um, very touchy situation. Then the chemical attack comes up. I, I immediately, Pastor Paul, went looking to see this being the rebels because of what happened in 2013. So much evidence ended up exonerating uh, Bashar al-Assad, but at the same token, if he really did gas his people, you know, I would have to be 100% behind President uh, Trump and what he did as far as uh, launching these attacks on uh, Assad's Air Force. What's your thoughts on these things? Yeah, I agree with you. I think that uh, President Trump is responding based on the intel he's getting. The question is, is the intel correct? Or is there is there inside uh, that are helping, that want to keep the war going, want to see Assad removed, and uh, especially with the CIA that really created this ISIS thing in the first place, okay, and has created this, and, uh, and pres gotta go back to President Obama, Stephen, who created the Arab Spring in the very first place, and including his goal was to take Assad out. And there's even biblical prophecy on that in Daniel chapter 11, 41 through 45, tells you all these countries are going to fall, but tidings from the east and from the north, which would be China and Russia, would stop it, basically. And it did. So that, so here's what I think happened. Uh, there is, I don't know, there's two possibilities. One, Assad was winning the war. Why would he drop gas on his own people? He even had Trump kind of back at him saying, you know, maybe it's okay we leave Saad in power. Why would he do that and jeopardize that? That's one question. Number two, uh, but he may have, okay? He may have, some are saying because of retaliation against those who had sided with the Free Syrian Army against him as a way of retaliation. We know the Arabic, Arabic people do that a lot. The second thing is this. What if it wasn't that? It, uh, there's a. I was just on the phone just before I came on here with a guy who's done, I don't know, I think he's done 11 different tours with d uh, contractors, Brother Stephen, in Iraq, in Kuwait, in Syria, 
and in other words, he was helping uh, companies move oil convoys around in dangerous war areas. So this guy's a contractor, a military con- contractor. He says to me, I'm, I'm telling you, Paul, I looked at the video of the footage of the kids burning with the, with the uh, chemicals. I see uh, 155 howitzers laying around everywhere, stacked nice and neat. He goes, that's the exact bombs they use, these howitzers. Uh, that's how they make IEDs, okay, they, to blow people up. But you can also take an, a 155 howitzer and you can put sarin gas in it and not make it an explosive, yeah. make it a gas bomb. He said they were stacked all around the place. So it makes you think maybe Assad was told to, uh, you know, that this was where rebels were, to bomb it and not knowing that there was sarin gas there and blows them up with the explosion and now he looks like he's bombed them with sarin gas and Trump does the does what would the leader any leader would do if you believe that that's what happened and that was send a message back so there's the two possibilities Stephen and uh, that second one I just told you is starting to gain traction right now well, you know, Pastor Paul, what's interesting, I didn't know that at all, and I really appreciate you sharing that with us, because for on our side, we when I began to dig, I found uh, immediately where uh, one of the uh, rebels there had tweeted the day before, there's going to be a big news story come out about a chemical attack uh, of chlorine gas. Now, there was, they, of course, there's sarin gas the next day. So we had seen that information. Uh, uh, we had uh, the fact that we had known different movements were going on, and uh, and on top of it, uh, we've got a close connection with Murad Gazdiev with RT. So immediately, I got in touch with him, especially after the bombs began to fall down. Because one of the things that I wanted to know is how come the S three hundred system in Syria or with Russia is not intervening? Because Russia's got planes at the same place. Well, yeah. Murad, let me know. No, they didn't fire any S three hundreds or anything. The reason being is because Russia had an agreement with the United States that they were allies. So the S-300 system was set that anything the U.S. is doing, they're not going to intervene with the U.S. in what they're doing. This is why Russia made a change in the stance. Um, you know, Pastor Paul, I'd like to go, because I know your time's limited. Uh, and, and regardless, I have to say, uh, again, like yourself, if, if Assad really did gas his people, I understand why President Trump did what he did. I do feel like that what President Trump has authorized is, like you're saying, based on the intel that he is being given. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people still in key positions of power that want that war. They want to topple uh, Bashar al-Assad and move him out. Uh, there's a lot of people vocal, like John McCain and Senator Lindsey Graham. All of these are vocal for moving him out of power. And uh, so they could easily manipulate things because while President Trump is saying that he's willing to see Bashar al-Assad stay in power on April the 2nd, at the exact same time, equipment is being loaded in Romania to be sent to Lebanon. So I don't, I honestly, uh, Brother Paul, I don't think President Trump realizes that that was actually going on. Now that's just my take on it uh, because uh, I've seen a passage here, Brother Paul, and I want to share this from a prophetic uh, standpoint on this. Uh, especially with you being a minister, we see we know the famous scripture here in, in Zechariah uh, that Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling uh, and shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem, verse 2. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone, okay? For all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. Just keep that in mind and and keep another thought in mind. I, I believe that when President Trump talked about moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, even though it was decided back in 1995 that it was going to be done by the Senate and the Congress, but he's the first president to actually make the action to actually carry out the plan. I think that's what set in motion this prophecy of Jerusalem becoming a a cup of trembling. But here's what gets interesting, Pastor Paul. You go into verse 4 and 5. In that day, says the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, every, his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the, of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. 
Now, Pastor Paul, here's what's ironic about this, pro this passage right here and this prophecy. The governors of Judah, most would think the Knesset members. Okay, someone like Rabbi Glick or, 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 or Benet, Benet, uh someone like that. But it can't be Knesset members because they're saying in their heart, basically in layman's terms, if we stand up for Israel, then God is going to back us up. And it says, their God. Now, Pastor Paul, in the Hebrew language, the word that is used there for the governors of Judah is a Hebrew word called alufi or alufim. Uh, alufi literally means in modern Hebrew, the champions of Judah or the chief friends of Judah. The house of Judah is what we're looking at here. So what do we see in, in prophecy right here? We are seeing someone that the Bible is calling the champions of Judah or the champions of the house of Judah, which is modern day Israel, are going to say in their heart, if we will stand with Israel in layman's terms, just kind of paraphrasing it, then th their God will stand for us. And it's funny, Pastor Paul, Michelle Bachman said about President Donald Trump right before all this, before he went, right when he got elected, that he will not be like President Obama, who never took seriously the prophecy about Abraham, those that bless you, I will bless, and those that curse you, I will curse. She said, but Trump will take that serious. And isn't it ironic, Pastor Paul, that you get into verse 6, and we find out that this champions of Israel, they're going to become a torch and a flame to all of the neighbors round about Israel. Not to mention the prophecy of the fact that all the nations are gathered against them. That was the United Nations, January 15th, when we see this scripture beginning to come to pass all over the fact that Trump wanted to move the embassy to Jerusalem and everybody got scared. So Obama immediately doesn't get involved, lets Resolution 2334 pass. And now we see these things happening, Pastor Paul. And I'm beginning to think that we're about to see some major biblical prophecies come into play, and I'm sure you've got a, a, a mouthful to speak about on that. Well, you know, what a great observation of the scripture in Zechariah 12. You're exactly right about the first three verses, talking about Jerusalem becoming this cup of trembling and burdensome stone for all people. And there's no question, if Donald Trump moves that U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, and I believe he will, it will cause Jerusalem to tremble because of the surrounding Arabic nations that will say, uh-oh, he has just declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel and the eternal city of God, which is prophecy, by the way. So Trump is following biblical prophecy, whether he knows it or not. God has set him in position like King Cyrus in a way, and he's truly accepting the responsibility of supporting Israel 100%. With His grandchildren are all Jewish. His daughter is Jewish now, married to, uh, to the Jewish man Jared Kirshner, and so... Uh, Trump, anyway, Trump understands from his own religious teachings as a child that you must stand with Israel. And if you do, you'll be blessed, like it says in Genesis 12, as you just made reference to. And then this fact that you bring in these ch these uh, questions here, I agree with you. It's not the governors of Judah. We're not talking about the political realm. We're talking about a spiritual move. And certainly what Trump is doing is saying, I'm with Israel. And I actually think, Stephen, he may make this announcement that he is moving it, maybe on Jerusalem Day, coming up in late May. Uh, he just might, okay? Or he might delay it six more months. Don't know, but I will have to see. But let's say he does in May say, we're moving. He's already got David Friedman there. He told him to set his office up in Jerusalem, okay? <laughs> so you know he's going to do this thing. And they've already sent two envoys there finding out where to set, the, set it up at, okay? So they're getting ready for this move. Now, let's say he does. To your point on the scripture, then this would make every, it mean like a torch with everybody around him. And that torch may have just got lit last night when yes. Trump fired those 59 Tomahawk missiles into this base. Now, I'm understanding that, uh, you know, it did some damage to that military base, destroyed six of Assad's airplanes. Maybe, you know, a few people may have been killed as well. I'm not sure about all of the, the, the ramification of it all. But the message was clear. Is saying, he didn't say he's taking Assad out of power, but he's sending a message to him that if he does something like that again, he is gone. It may be, though, that he is going to try to go after him as well. I'm hoping not. 
because it would just escalate the whole thing. But we have to wait and see what his intel has been given and what he's going to do. Now, having said that, to your point about this scripture, this is definitely biblical prophecy playing out. Remember, I've been saying this for a while, and you know this, that if he moves that embassy to Jerusalem, it really does give the Knesset energy to go to reclaim the Temple Mount. And Brother Stephen, King Abdullah II was in Trump's office the day before this attack. He's meeting with the King of Jordan, who's in charge of the Temple Mount. And, and the King of Jordan has come out and endorsed Trump's attack on Syria. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau supports it. It was supported by almost everybody. He's getting tons of support on this movie made, which is isolating Assad and Russia in some degree to try to put pressure maybe on Russia to give up Assad for a different uh, scenario. And there's one other thing that Trump did with this, whether this bad intel or not. He did it with the, with the Chinese president sitting at dinner with him which sends a message to China, this guy will pull the trigger, let's deal with North Korea. So there's a lot on the table, and I think on a biblical side of it here, you're right. We may have just moved into verses 5 and 6 in play. You know, Pastor Paul, it's, what's fascinating as well is you mentioned North Korea. I do believe that they're definitely going after North Korea next. We've seen all the different moves that are in place Russia, by the way, did declare today publicly that uh, is kind of interesting the way he did it, though, West Jerusalem to be the capital of yeah. Israel. He came off the fence about that, uh, and but he's still holding out East Jerusalem for the capital of Palestine. Uh, I am not, best of all, I am not for a two-state solution. I never have been. Uh, you know, I, I, when we did the interview with uh, Yehuda Glick, Rabbi Glick there, I asked him point blank what I wanted to ask John Kerry when we were in France, and that is, uh, what does he think about the United Nations? How can he trust the United Nations when the United Nations can never keep their promise to the Jewish people for a Jewish homeland? And right. I like this answer. He says, we do not trust the United Nations. I uh, do, too. I like that answer. He was strong. He also said the two-state solution is dead. No more. Don't want to hear it again. And gave me a lecture for even... <laughs> <laughs> We're bringing it up. I'm just asking the question. I'm with him on that. But uh, I am going to be meeting with Rabbi Yehuda Glick in just a couple months. And so it will be a, wow, the timing of everything now, it might we might get some more insight into this thing. And uh, you were there. You heard his response. He don't trust the UN at no. all. No. And do you think that Rabbi Yehuda Glick, and I shouldn't ask you the question, but is he is he building a coalition within the Knesset? Uh, you know, is he building something here? I would think that he needs to. And I, and the reason why I say this, uh, Pastor Paul, is because as I'm watching the things that are unfolding uh, right now inside of Israel, uh, I know that, for example, Simon Tov, he was, he was actually there at the meeting when uh, Rabbi Glick spoke at the uh, conference that we were holding there. He asked him privately after the meeting, did he know what President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu were doing uh, behind the scenes with this new one-state deal that they're trying to work out? And he said he had absolutely no knowledge of what is really going on. Now, that kind of concerns me because he is, uh, uh, you know, he's part of the Likud party as well. I would, I love, to see, I would love to see him form his own party. Uh, coalition and his own party in the event that he may end up running for the Knesset as prime minister uh, in the future. Uh, I think it'd be, it'd be a wise decision there because one thing I like about uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick, the MK member there of the parliament in, or the Knesset in Israel, is that he wants to have peace with his neighbors as well. And I really appreciate that about him, Pastor Paul, because we know that prophecy is going to happen. I mean, I, I'd mentioned to you before we came on, we were talking about Nahum a little bit. Uh, we know in chapter 2, and, and over there in verses, uh, I believe it's verses 9 and 10, is speaking about they're going to go in there into Nineveh, which is the ancient city of Mosul. Uh, they were going to take all the silver and the gold, the fine furniture, etc. We saw this fulfilled with Isis. Then you get down into chapter 3, and we find out that Assyria and Nineveh become a desolate waste, Pastor Paul. Now, that may be in Micah. I may be getting them mixed yeah. up. Uh, oh, no, Zephaniah. Zephaniah. No, you got it right. It's Nahum. 
You're right. In Nahum chapter 2, verse 8, but Nineveh is of old like a pool of water, yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. And then in Nahum chapter 3, verse 7, as you just uh, quoted, and it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? When shall I seek comforters for thee? Yes, now, yes. And, and it's, I believe it's, that prophecy is coming to pass you. I think that that may be in play. That's what's happening right now with what the U.S. is doing over in Mosul, because Nineveh is right in the heart of Mosul, the ancient city of Nineveh. But when you go into Zephaniah, and I forget exactly where that was at, Pastor Paul, that's what I meant to bring out as well. It mentions Assyria and Nineveh together as one collective group, and both of them coming a total desolation. Uh, so I bring this up because you see the battle in Mosul. We see what is happening inside of Syria. The move that Trump has made now, the question is going to be, uh, Pastor Paul, is whether or not Russia is either going to try gracefully to have Assad to say, finally, look, they're building up the troops. They're going to come in. If you are not going to bow out and let me put you someplace safe where you can leave in dignity, then we're going to end up in a third world war. And that's my big concern is whether or not Russia is going to stand their ground. Are they going to try to get Assad to leave? Or are we about to see this prophecy come to pass? Because Damascus has to become a ruinous heap. And Pastor right. Paul, I'll drop one in there for you that I, that I found out a few, back when we were in Israel. We have some good friends that do heavy business with Israel. And they had shared with us that Israel was planning a strike on Syria. Now, that could be for retaliation. Israel's never admitted it, and I can't say it's really so. Syria alleges that they shot down one of Israel's uh, F uh, F-16s. Uh, Israel said that never happened, but they're still holding to the dead. There's no, we see no video footage to prove that it ever happened. So I don't know if the, if the case is so or not, but nonetheless, we had picked up uh, in the Russian language there when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu had met with uh, President Putin back in December. He spoke about doing a, a, an actual invasion into Syria because of Hezbollah, because of Iran on their borders. And so I understand his positioning on that. But, you know, Pastor Paul, that's going to put that's going to put uh, Damascus in the crosshairs. Yes, it will. And, and the verse you were quoting, I just looked it up while you are talking, it's, it's Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 13, says, And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. So, lay, so it's the same thing. Zephaniah is prophesying the same thing that Nahum is prophesying, but he adds Assyria in there, which goes along with what? Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah Damascus, and actually in chapter 49, verses 23 through 27, he even breaks it down for you in four verses how Damascus becomes a ruinous heap. It's not one big huge nuke. It's a grad it's a gradual process, which about seven my reports are I'm getting from a man out of Canada, Mark, who has friends in Syria says 70% of Damascus is just about rubble. About 30% of the city is functional. And that's where Assad is and the government employees and those folks. You and I stood on, uh, in, in Israel, we stood on the Golan Heights and we, we took and looked right into the streets of Damascus and we seen the rubble. There's no question about it. So prophecies are coming to pass right before our very eyes and it seems like it's collectively. You got to go to these Old Testament prophets to, to happen in these last days. You're right, Pastor Paul. Very, very true. Very true. And we are definitely, I know you don't have much time, Pastor Paul. I want to thank you for coming on here with us on Israeli News Live to, to take a look at Syria from a prophetic standpoint. I know it's a blessing to the people uh, as well that, that like the, the prophetic side of the broadcast here. 
Uh, those of you that are that are watching, Pastor Paul Begley has a, a wonderful YouTube channel. If you if you don't know him already, I couldn't imagine you not knowing uh, uh, Pastor Paul. But I'm sure we have a lot of people out there that would, maybe just would not that listen mainly for the new news side of our program. Uh, and also, uh, he is a host uh, in, uh, of the television program, The Coming Apocalypse. Pastor Paul, how can people contact you there if they would like to get in touch with you? Yeah, just go to my website at uh, paulbegleyprophecy.com. That's www.paulbegleyprophecy.com. There you'll find everything and get you up to speed on anything you and how to contact us is there at our website. And so uh, uh, we're getting ready to go live on air here in a few minutes. As a matter of fact, this is going to be a huge topic. No question about it. And if you were available, I don't know if you are, I would love to bring you on for a few minutes I'll be to discuss available. this very situation. <laughs> I'm available, Pastor Paul. So, all okay. right. God bless you. Thank you for, for joining us. God bless you, those of you watching here this afternoon. I'm Stephen Venu. You're watching Israeli News Live, Erev Torf.